Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome. Um, we are now streaming to Facebook, so sorry about that. Um, and we are ready to get going. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We have a fascinating webinar coming up. Um, Hell or High Water, the untold story of how Israel is sharing her water miracle with South Africa and the world. Uh, please, if you uh, would like to type in the chat, let us know where you're from, say hi. Uh, you can also, throughout the sem seminar, uh, type your questions in the chat, or you can use the Q&A box is the better way to send us a question. So please keep the questions going, say hi to everybody. And with that, I, as it is my great pleasure to uh, hand over to Michael Kranstorf, National Chairman of the JNF SA, to kick things off. Great, thanks, David, and thanks to everybody for coming. We've had an amazing response um, to our Hello High Water panel tonight. We've had uh, hundreds of, of registrations, and um, a big thank you, really, to the community for the support um, for the webinar. We've got some fantastic speakers, some of the top experts in the world on water, and you know, water's really become a really important topic in South Africa. It's it's probably the next big crisis that we're facing. Uh, those of us that live in Glen Hazel experienced uh, a few, for the last two weeks what it's like when the taps run dry. And those of you in Cape Town had issues with water quality this week, where the city of Cape Town, which is one of the best um, run municipalities in the country, con uh, issued a warning about drinking the, the water in Cape Town. And the situation is, 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 is worse in, in many small towns um, around the country. So we at the JNF have always been um, committed to sharing and promoting Israeli achievements in the area of, in, of the environment, but especially in the area of water. And um, we've organized the seminar with, uh, with some of the top panelists in the world. We've got uh, Seth Siegel, a, a leading uh, New York Times bestselling author. We've got Daron Markle um, from KKL, who's the chief water scientist for the KKL. We've got Sivan Yairi, who's done amazing work in Africa and South Africa in promoting um, Israeli technology and helping um, to bring water to rural communities. And we've got Amit Lev from, from the Israeli embassy and the trade office, um, who's gonna share with us some of the technology that's Israeli technology that's, gonna, that's come to South Africa and that's improving the lives of South Africans. Most of these things have never really been publicized before. And uh, we're very excited to be able to, to share with uh, the Jewish community the miracle of what Israel's done in, in terms of water and also how it's sharing that miracle with, with South Africa and the rest of the world. Um, we at the JNF have, have centers in Mamalodi and um, near Durban in Hammondsdale where we try and share Israeli know-how and, um, and technology with regard to water, the environment, uh, conservation, with learners, um, and, and that's a massive um, um, objective of ours, in addition to raising money and um, contributing towards the development um, of the land of Israel. So, and you know, South African Jewry has made a massive contribution in this regard. Um, and we're gonna start with a, with a short video, just highlighting Israel's water miracle um, and, and uh, the role that, that diaspora communities have played in funding um, and contributing to, towards that water miracle. So if David could now, we'll kick over to him for, um, to run the, the first AV on Israel's water miracle. It makes up more than 70% of the earth and 60% of our bodies. But what happens when water is nearly impossible to come by? Here in Israel, more than half the land area is made up of dry, arid desert. That's why we've had to come up with creative solutions to stay hydrated. Israel is home to some of the most advanced and innovative solutions in water conservation technology. Today, Israel recycles about 85% of its water, the highest in the world, and 50% of the water used for agriculture is a product of recycling. The Halutza communities, once a dry and barren desert, are the embodiment of modern-day pioneering, supported by philanthropic movements like Jewish National Fund USA. 
We are using the NFT is a hydroponics. It's, it's built with a, t a tunnel that you grow inside the greens. It saves water and a, it gives you a advanced growing. Their investment in cutting edge water solutions like hydroponic farming has helped Chalutza thrive as one of the most successful agricultural communities in the Negev, allowing them to grow exceptional crops that are sold throughout the world. We may be standing in the middle of the desert, but by looking around, you'd never know it. East of Chalutza, in Beersheba, the city landscape has been completely transformed into a water city in the Negev desert after a world-class $300 million urban revitalization initiative, also supported by Jewish National Fund USA. Welcome to the biggest lake uh, in Israel, here in Beersheba. Um, you know, the city of Beersheba, the capital city of the Negev, the metropolis city for over a million residents that live here in the area. If you would have told us 10 or 15 years ago that this would happen, nobody would have believed it. I'm a Beersheba, born and raised here, and having this oasis changes the entire experience of actually living here in the Negev. And it all comes down to this, water recycling. This is the Ramat Aviv Water Treatment Center. This one specifically strengthens the development of sustainable communities in the desert and near the Egyptian border. We are at the facilities of the Ramat Negev uh, water treatment plant, treating effluence, municipal effluence, from the military camps surrounding us and uh, the villages. Hopefully in the very near future, we shall accommodate much more water effluence coming from other uh, nearby uh, regions. We need the water here. JNF USA has made it their mission to support Israel's effort to create advanced technology for sustainability and become a global leader in water innovation. The advances in water technology and ecology in Israel have increased the country's water economy by over 15 percent and that number is only increasing. Two decades ago Israel was dealing with water shortage and droughts and as part of Jewish National Fund USA's mission to help develop the Negev and Galilee in Israel, water was such a crucial, essential part of our investment. And working together with so many different communities and organizations and researchers and businesses in order to be able to create opportunities to build life here in the Negev, to build life in the north, to be able to create something out of nothing, it all starts with the water. So for us at Jewish National Fund USA, World Water Day is a time where we celebrate and rejoice how far we've come from Israel being a country that was dealing with drought to now recycling over 85% of all of our wastewater. The value of water is about so much more than just its price. Its importance is undeniable to every country, community, and individual around the world. Lauren Izzo, ILTV. Great, I think that's a great introduction to, uh, and for, to what we have in store tonight. I'm going to hand over now um, to our host for the evening, who's Benji Schulman. I'm sure most of you know him. Um, he, he's the greenest, proudest Zionist in the community. Um, he's got a master's in, in geography, and uh, he's also the public uh, policy uh, affairs um, officer for the South African Zionist Federation. He's uh, part of uh, the JNF executive team. And he's also worked for the JNF for many years. He's taken tours to Israel um, for the JNF. And so I think there's nobody better placed um, to host the evening um, and to introduce our speakers. So over to you, Benji, and here, everyone enjoy the night. Thank you uh, very much, Mike, and uh, welcome to all of our panelists and to everyone uh, who's here. Uh, just going through the names here. And we're seeing people from all over the country, all over the world, um, and uh, members of parliament here, people from the water uh, advocacy community. Um, just uh, I've seen a couple of hydrologists. So it's really great to see uh, such a wide range of people joining us tonight. And thank you so much um, for your for your time. You know, when when I first started in uh, in, in university and I was in my environmental studies class. And, and uh, this was about the time when people in South Africa started learning the words ESCOM and load shedding. 
uh, together in one space. Um, uh, and, and lack of electricity was really the thing that was driving the conversation. And my lecturer sat us all down and said, look, forget about the electricity. You know, water is really where the next crisis is coming from. And, and we didn't really take us so much seriously, but, but the truth is now it doesn't matter whether you're in Cape Town or uh, Guyani or Glen Hazel, uh, the issue of uh, water is enormously serious. Uh, and then I think it really affects everyone uh, in, in South Africa. And to just give uh, just a little bit of, a, of an overview, not an overview, just to have some statistics, which might uh, be of interest. There was a report that was released by the Institute of Race Relations into uh, water uh, coverage and sustainability in South Africa. It's called Thirsty Land, if you want to go read it. And there's a couple of statistics, which I think are just like worth mentioning up front. So on average in a South African municipality, 37% of water is, is lost to leaks. Uh, that actually goes up to 60% in some municipalities, as bad as that. Um, the, the, the amount of money that is required for us to fix and maintain our water infrastructure in South Africa over the next decade is somewhere between, um, it was not somewhere between, it's around 900 billion rand. Uh, of which we only have about two thirds. So that means that we need 330 billion Rand if we're gonna be fixing our water infrastructure in the next 10 years. And that's crucial because our demand is gonna outstrip supply by 17% uh, in South Africa in terms of usable water in the next decade. Uh, so it's not a crisis that's coming, it's a crisis that's uh, very much here. And I would encourage people to read the report uh, just not before bedtime because it's not great. Uh, for, for, for sleeping. Now, we haven't come to depress you tonight. Uh, rather, we, we've come to talk about what are the challenges, but also what are the solutions. And we do have the most extraordinary set of experts that you're going to meet tonight, people who I've uh, engaged with over, over my time uh, or their organizations and who people really know what they're doing and what they're saying. And I'm hoping that what we can do is take some, uh, take some lessons uh, from the Israeli experience and see what can be applied uh, to, to the South African context. And you're also going to get to see some of what's already being applied and what is uh, already being effective. So uh, it's exciting uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, please do know if you want to take uh, questions, we have a Q&A, we have a chat. Uh, please uh, take, um, take the opportunity. I see some people are really uh, putting, putting in some stuff uh, in there and we'll, I'm not going to take your questions during the, the discussion, but we will, uh, we will do it. Uh, we'll do it afterwards. So please, if you want to uh, ask a question, please just type it into the chat and we'll be very, very happy to take you. Uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic discussion. So with all of that out of the way, let me introduce uh, our first speaker for the evening, um, who is Seth Siegel. And uh, Seth is a uh, he's a writer and a lawyer and an activist and a serial entrepreneur, and he has held several uh, Jewish communal roles in areas as diverse as Israel advocacy, security, and education. Uh, he's, but for most importantly, for the purposes of this discussion, uh, he is the author of Let There Be Water, which is Israel's solution for a water-starved world. And uh, he is actually uh, author of a number of other books on water and is also a fellow at the University of Wisconsin Center for Water Policy and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and I can say that I, uh, everywhere that I go, uh, where I have to uh, give a book to someone and they want to know about Israel, I give them Seth's book. Uh, Seth will be happy to know you've overtaken Startup Nation in the office uh, as the book that we give to people uh, when we want to tell them about Israel. Uh, so, and I'm happy to say that if you want Seth's book, please, we'll be giving out the details afterwards. We have his book uh, in, in the office uh, and it really is a fantastic, fantastic read. So Seth, Welcome to South Africa. Thank you for joining us uh, on on our uh, on on our webinar tonight. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you. It's like great to be here. I apologize for my accent. Uh, I hope you can all understand me despite uh, this accent of mine. But uh, but it's great to, it's great to uh, be with you, and I admire very much the work that you do. Thank you, Seth. And don't worry, <laughs> we all speak American, so you you shouldn't be concerned. Um, 
So we started off with uh, just your, your very varied uh, involvement uh, in all sorts of things, uh, particularly I didn't talk about all your commercial activities. So, so maybe tell us, how did you get into the, the, the business of water and the issue of water? How did you decide that that had become uh, an issue that you wanted to tackle? Well, uh, as, as you mentioned in the very generous introduction of me, I am a member of the foreign policy think tank called the Council on Foreign Relations. One day, uh, just by chance, I happened to step into a briefing by a uh, senior US government intelligence official who reported that, and this was quite a number of years ago, who reported that the US government believed with a high degree of certainty that by the year 2035, which then was a very long time away, which now is not so long away anymore, but he reported that uh, the US government believed that by 2035, the world would face enormous water scarcity problems, uh, not starting on 2035, but accelerating from this date about 10 or so years ago, and that it was going to result in all kinds of global problems, higher food prices, social instability, possibly the fall of governments important to the West, uh, possibly a need to change America's defense uh, architecture, and certainly a possibility of global uh, refugee flows. And I left the meeting uh, concerned, interested uh, about the topic. Uh, I went back to my office. I started reading about water scarcity. But what struck me was probably like many of the several hundred people on this call, uh, I'd been to Israel a number of times. I knew the country fairly well. And I thought of it you know, more in terms of probably the country being, well, a large part of the country being a desert and, and the rest of the country being dry. I knew that, that the rainfall was just in a few winter months. Uh, and I knew there was a fast growing population. And I knew that there'd be all kinds of, should be all kinds of problems around water. But I discovered to my amazement, as I kept reading for days and weeks uh, following that presentation, that nearly every single solution to water scarcity around the world was either invented in Israel or had been significantly enhanced by the Israeli experience. So it just came to me as a person who's just curious to to just learn more about it if I could learn more about it. And I started reading here and reading there. And, um, and then I planned a trip to Israel, a two week trip to only interview people. One of whom, by the way, is Doron Markel, who's on this panel, remarkably enough, to interview people to, uh, uh, to tell me more about the water story of Israel. And when I came back, I, I thought to myself, you know, there might be a good article here. And I wrote a couple of articles for the New York Times, for the Wall Street Journal and other US newspapers. And then it hit me one day, although I'd never written a book, that it might be a story that other people would like. Well, I would just want you to know it's a Cinderella. I don't know if Cinderella is a story you have in South Africa, but you do, Cinderella, okay. So, so uh, you know, it's kind of a Cinderella story of, of you know, the, the uh, simple person who ends up becoming the princess. Um, I write this book with the expectation that it will sell 500 copies, which is about the number that most nonfiction books sell in the United States. And it has become a complete phenomenon. I donate all of the royalties to, uh, to JNF USA, uh, or uh, some of it to other causes around water in Israel, but but most of it to JNF USA, and um, and what I have found to, to my amazement is that this is a story that's interest of interest not just to people in water scarce areas and not just to Jewish people. The book is now out in more than twenty languages in more than fifty countries. It's been a it's been a huge bestseller in India. It's been a huge bestseller in Czech Republic, in Vietnam, and other disparate places like that. And that it's nice, it's nice in terms of two things. First, it's very nice to be able to provide countries, policymakers, government officials, business leaders, journalists, academics with solutions, practical solutions that can work because they have worked in Israel. And I can say to this audience, it's really a very special delight and pleasure to be able to tell an extremely positive story about Israel that people around the world uh, can enjoy and, and, and enjoy tapping into, regardless of whatever their level of Zionist awareness is. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you, you talk about the growth of the book, Seth. I think the first time I encountered you in your book was at the talk that you gave at the United Nations in, in 2014. Uh, yeah. and, and that's, uh, you know, and, and that's now we're talking eight years ago, and, and the book has continued to sell and continue to be uh, of demand. So I think you definitely uh, hit a a vein or a, or, or a tributary is probably a better term uh, in this particular. Ben, ben, Benji, I'd, I'd like to tell you, I'd like to tell you that I've spoken all over the world. I've not spoken live in South Africa. I had a trip that I was trying to pull together and then it got canceled sort of not the last moment, but a few weeks before I was going to leave for the US for South Africa. It was a few years ago. 
um, and not through not through uh, uh, JNF South Africa, uh, through another organization. <clears throat> but in any event, uh, I've spoken all over the world. I've spoken literally hundreds of times. I've spoken to the U.S. Congress twice, the U.N. three times, the World Bank a few times, uh, the OECD in Europe, uh, and. Each and every one of these times, it's exactly as I reported. It's a very, ex I, I've spoken at more than 40 universities. I, I assume you know the names of leading US institutions, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, University of Chicago, and 40 others. It's really a very great delight to be able to tell these two stories. As I said, the solutions to problems, you know, we have so many problems in the world, climate change, race relations, poverty, hunger, that there's no obvious answers to. And it is such a delight to be able to walk into a room and share with people that we know that there's an answer that will work because Israel has been the, the laboratory for this for a very long time and has made it work. And then also, as I say, it's very satisfying. I can say this to an audience like this. It's very satisfying to share with people who have no Israel connection at all, how, uh, why Israel, why, why, why we all on this call think of Israel as a light onto the nations, to quote uh, the prophet Isaiah. So let's get into the book now uh, for a little bit. And of course, uh, you, you're talking about the innovations and the bright, shiny stuff, uh, which is coming uh, from Israel. And we're going to hear about it from you and from many of our panelists. But before we start with that, I want to ask something that maybe gets uh, a little bit glossed over, which which is is the issue of cultural respect, if you like, for, for water in Israel, because that's something that anyone can actually take away uh, if they if if they watch this webinar, you don't have to be a, a water technical expert to under, to alter how you treat water. And you have this delightful little part in the book where you talk about nursery rhymes that that, uh, that happen in Israel. Uh, if of course, if this is an English speaking audience, everyone will know uh, the, the the thing that we teach youngsters, which is rain, rain, go away, come back another day. Uh, but in, in Israel uh, and in Hebrew, they have another one, which I'm going to mutilate in the translation, so I apologize. But it's, uh, you know, something like lots of clouds in the sky, lots of big droplets, let's clap. Uh, I'm assuming it sounds better uh, in, in, in Hebrew. But, but I think it illustrates very nicely uh, the, the cultural shift that Israel has undergone uh, in its relationship to water. And I just wonder if you could start off by talking about that. Yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful place to start. Uh, there are obviously not one reason that Israel's a success in water and how Israel's morphed into or become a global water superpower and a model for everywhere, everyone, whether large country, small country, rich country, poor country, uh, landlocked country, or country with a long sea coast. It's, it, but, but there are several reasons. Uh, but I, I would say that culture is an extremely important factor. And culture, uh, the culture of Israel, of course, is an interesting culture to, it, based, of course, on an ancient religious uh, civilization, but also a modern Zionist civilization, which is one of ferment and challenging and questioning and, and scientific inquiry. Zionism, of course, is a political revolution, but it's also a sociological and a sociological revolution, but it's also a scientific revolution. Um, and, and, and so the cultural piece of it is extremely important because it underpins everything else that's a success about Israel. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural phenomenon that people believe that just as it is important to defend the borders, just as it is important to welcome immigrants, just as it is important to do other things, the idea of water is extremely important to everyone's outlook. And that you would think is obvious, so the necessity is the mother invention or that it's true everywhere, but it simply isn't. And what, what makes that special is that once everyone have inculcated into themselves how utterly important water is and how precious it is, then you're able to ask of people other types of compromises, whether it's to pay full price for water, whether it's to compromise and sacrifice when pipes are being dug and streets are being torn up. Um, and it also, it creates an opportunity for people to, no, no one likes to pay more for water, but it allows people to understand why Israel needs to spend what it spends on such a, a, a really a wonderful water system domestically. Now, let's talk a little bit about also the South African experience here because that's part of what we wanna get across. And there's a very interesting phenomenon in Israel in that uh, the South African, in South Africa, we've nationalized our water. And in, in Israel, you have a nationalized water system. Uh, which is, is very much run by the government. Uh, now, that, that might be something which people are a bit surprised at and uh, would like to know if, if you think that that is a good system uh, in terms of, 
um, in terms of border provision, given what we know about governments in general uh, and, and, and how they tend to operate, it's, it's an, an interesting aspect of the system, which, which I think has some resonance here in South Africa. And I, I guess I'm kind of asking, how did, how did the Israelis make a government-run water system work? Actually, Benji, I want to slightly correct you on your orientation. So first of all, the water is, is still owned by the public, but the public, by virtue of legislation, has denominated the Israel Water Authority to run the water system for the country. But that's only half of it. And everywhere in the world that I examined, but for a very few cases, but virtually everywhere in the world, the water systems are controlled one way or another by the government, as you say. In Israel, it is a governmental function, but it is not controlled by the government. The, the, the Israel Water Authority, which one of our participants, Doran Markel, uh, uh, worked for for many years, and he can attest to this or speak to it in more detail if he desires, but, but um, uh, the Israel Water Authority is a technocratic, apolitical body. Under the law that created the Israel Water Authority, every five years, a designated cabinet minister, the minister usually of infrastructure or energy or water, uh, will announce who the, who the head of the water authority is. So far, it has been uh, non-political personalities. And then that person is, has a mandate for five years to run the water authority. And everybody who works there, the several hundred people who work there, none of them are political appointees. They all come from a point of view of how can we achieve for Israel the highest, best use of water? How can we get the most water for the most people at the most reasonable price? And that actually is the essential point of difference. In politics, you reward your friends, you hurt your enemies. Politics is about the allocation of resources for winners and losers. In Israel, it is a, it has a, the Israel Water Authority has a societal view that is the focus of how to get things done. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fascinating uh, because uh, I think one of the, the major challenges in, in the South African context is the, uh, not really the politicization so much as the, uh, the extent to which tech, te technocracy uh, is, running the, is running the show from a water perspective. So I think that that is an important lesson that we can certainly take away. I'm, 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 I'm actually agnostic as to who should run a water system for the country. Uh, whether it's a private business or a government agency. But what I do know is it has to be taken out of the hands of politicians who will be always incentivized to reward their friends and hurt their enemies. And, and, and will also have another problem, which is politicians will always suppress the price of water. And as long as you are subsidizing it or subsidizing it away by not improving the system, letting the pipes, would you say before, 60% at some place, 6% of the, of the leakage level? Well, that comes about because of neglect. And what does the neglect come about? Because the politicians in that area decided that it would be politically less uh, difficult to let the pipes rot in the ground where nobody sees it and nobody knows about the 60% water loss than to say, we're going to fix the quality of the water, we're going to fix the quality of the infrastructure. And you do that because you say, well, let's keep the price artificially low. In Israel, the price of water reflects exactly the real cost of every part of the equation. The sourcing of the water, the administration of the water, the scientific protection of the water, uh, and every other part of it. And that is great. When the public owns, when the public has to pay the real price for water, they're going to be more careful with it. And they're also going to demand a better quality system. So you, you took the question away from me before I could ask I apologize. because it was going to be the, <laughs> the, the policy question. But what's interesting, uh, and I think and Doron will, will touch on this a little bit later, but in, all, in one way in which they've been able to get around this problem has been the issue of recycling water, particularly for farmers, because then you can offer uh, a, a water grade to farmers, which is agriculturally acceptable, but not uh, acceptable from a drinking quality perspective. And so you don't have to charge as much for it. And, and uh, that has been another success in terms of uh, being able to get water uh, and get past the resistance to the price. Yes, well, I took, I have a whole chapter in the book, uh, Let There Be Water, about that. And I'll, I'll briefly share it with your wonderful audience here. And I'm utterly amazed, by the way, that 350 some odd participants is just utterly, uh, or almost that many, is utterly extraordinary and uh, a real tribute to the organization. Uh, amazing. I'm so glad that you contacted me and so glad that I, uh, that I accepted. Um, Listen, the story about the recycled water in Israel starts in, a, in an amazing way. It starts actually in 1952. 
Israel had all the water it needed then, but the leadership, which was dealing with bankruptcy and weapons acquisition and terrorism and the fear of no more wars and immigrant absorption and education, all these other things, they, they make a decision that they have to stay on top of the water equation. They can't defer the issue for a later date. It has to be a current issue. And one of the things that they decide, this is 1952, the country is only just barely four years old. What they make a decision is to say that, well, there's enough water right now. And the national water carrier at that time was, which we're not talking about right now, is, is the big water system was still under construction. What was under planning at that point, actually. What they started talking about was the fact that someday they would run out of water. And they knew that they would need to augment that water. And at that time, desalination was not a credible uh, science. In fact, it barely began then. And, um, and so therefore they had this idea that, that they could start a program to create a parallel national water infrastructure system, which ended up taking several decades to complete, billions of dollars to pay for, par partially I'm sure through the donations of the wonderful people on this call, but it with a very long time to complete and that, but when it would be completed, you could use the water for either to purify it to a drinking water level, or you could use it at a very high level of purity for agriculture. And by virtue of the fact that about half of all of the water used in agriculture is not fresh water, but is, is, is this recycled water, it transforms the water equation for the country. Most, most people who are city dwellers don't realize this, but by far and away, agriculture is the largest user of water between 70 and 95% of every country in the world's fresh water is utilized for agriculture. And if you can change that by 10%, you change the water equation. If you can change that by 50%, you are going to have a very water secure country. And that's the story of Israel. Seth, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Unfortunately, I have to uh, break us there to, to move on to some of the other guests, but thank you very much for joining us and please, uh, uh, we will put in the chat where you can get the book. We do have it uh, at our office on special, uh, a really a good read. Um, you don't have to wait for Christmas. Shabbat is around the corner. Tick the mail. You can do uh, a, a water discussion uh, for in a week's time. So please do contact us uh, because we really uh, we've just scratched the surface with regards to uh, what you find in the book. It's very and it's not at all a, a technical read. It's very accessible. Uh, even I understood it when I read it. So, uh, it's, I, I, it's I actually actually wrote it with an with a, a child who's in high school in mind. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to, no technical, scientific, or or uh, engineering uh, insights needed, uh, because I wanted the story to be widely known. Okay, I'll stop here because I know you have other wonderful uh, uh, guests. Thank you. No right. problem, but but definitely I can I can uh, attest to that. Seth, thank you so much for your time. We we really appreciate it. Thank you. Now. Moving on to our next guest uh, is uh, Dr. Doron Markle, uh, and he is uh, absolutely fascinating. He is the chief scientist of uh, KKL JNF uh, in Israel, and uh, he, he has done all sorts of uh, amazing things in terms of the Israeli water story, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about that, um, including uh, just to give you some of the, the projects that he's been involved in, he's the head of the Lake Kinneret Watershed Monitoring and Management Department. Uh, you, we also have uh, already had a question on this, the Red Sea Dead Sea Conveyance Feasibility Study, which is a, a almost a sci-fi uh, type of water project, uh, which maybe uh, Daron will talk about. The Khula Valley, which is of course the famous uh, place which is now known for its birds, but was once known as a swamp. Uh, and all sorts of other very, very interesting elements uh, in the water economy of Israel. Um, but perhaps, uh, 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 Dr. Markle, you have uh, come at a very interesting time in South African, uh, South African politics because uh, you were the 12th, at the 12th International Climate Change Conference in Havana, Cuba, uh, and you were the first Israeli scientist to speak at a formal scientific conference uh, in Cuba, and, and you, you won't know this, but uh, there's been a massive debate uh, here in South Africa uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks because we've been importing Cuban, uh, not cigars, uh, water engineers uh, for, for the purposes of, um, of, of helping our water system. So maybe you can uh, comment politely on your, uh, on your professional peers' abilities in, in, in this area. 
Um, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, yeah, please feel free welcome. to uh, uh, show us your presentation. You're welcome. Yeah, and and that that conference uh, back in uh, July 2019 in Havana, Havana Cuba was. Uh, a climate change conference, and I will uh, elaborate a little bit uh, about the climate crisis. So let me put on my presentation. Um, I hope you can see it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, let's let's see that it starts as a presentation. Yeah. So hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm I'm. Dr. Doron Markel, I serve as the chief scientist of uh, Karen Kaimetli Israel, KKL JNF. Previously, I've served for many years for the uh, Israeli Water Authority, which uh, uh, says, um, uh, described precisely, unbelievably. Um, and I also represented Israel in the study uh, management unit of the International Feasibility Study for the Red Sea Dead Sea conveyance pro uh, program, which I will try to uh, um, speak a little bit, uh, maybe for one one or two minutes uh, um, in, in the end of the presentation. Uh, and I will speak today about uh, the global water crisis challenges and solutions, but uh, um, uh, focus uh, in, in Israel, the Middle East, and the climate crisis impacts on the national um, water balance in Israel and how KKLGNF tried to um, uh, help to um, stabilize this um, uh, water balance. So let's start with um, the climate change. And um, I hope everybody agree that the climate change is a scientific fact. Um, and, and here you can see the, the uh, rising CO2 concentration uh, in the atmosphere as measured in the formal uh, um, monitoring station in the Mauna Loa of Hawaii. You see that the, the CO2 concentration increased from 320 uh, uh, ppms in the 1960s to about 420 in the uh, latest years. Um, temperatures all over the world are higher and higher. Here you can see the temperatures, uh, um, animalities in 2018, which was a very hot year all over the world. And it came out that 2019 was even hotter with uh, uh, record breaking uh, heat waves in France, for example, the event in June, 2019, and uh, and also uh, um, uh, droughts all over the world, like this one in India, caused even deaths of people. So um, temperatures temperatures are, are oh sorry sorry let's go let's go back yeah temperatures are um, rising all over the world, but look in Israel. Temperature has uh, risen in two degrees since the 1970s and, and the 1980s. Uh, the, the Paris Agreement speaks about limiting the 1.5 Celsius degrees increase until 2030. Here in Israel, it reached already two degrees uh, um, up, to, up to date. So uh, uh, the Middle East is a hotspot. Of climate of uh, climate change, uh, like like California and and western uh, and southwest of uh, of uh, Australia, uh, we use we use models, um, climatic models, in order to uh, predict the future um, um, climate, and uh, the, these models point for future. Uh, higher temperatures, even even higher temperatures in the Middle East, and uh, a decrease of na natural pre precipitation. Uh, here you can see a model by Evans et al. Uh, uh, point for a significant decrease 
of, um, of precipitation until 2050 and even more decrease of precipitation until the end of the century. So uh, we can summarize the impact uh, of, the, of the climate change on the Middle East saying that there are um, two main outcomes uh, in the Middle East. One will be uh, drier winters. And since the winter is the only season we have, the only wet season, the only season we have rain, drier winters means less uh, uh, available natural water, uh, decrease of, of water levels. Here you see a picture of the Sea of Galilee with low levels. Yes, we had two, two good years uh, uh, in two, 2019 and 2020. However, uh, according to the models, we think uh, it's going to be a low level again in the future. And the other outcome is hotter summers, which mean uh, more heat waves and higher risk for, for uh, different risks, but, but uh, between them, the risk of um, uh, forest fires, like the terrible uh, forest fire we had in Mount Carmel back in 2010. So now um, let's focus on the um, national uh, water balance of Israel. How much water do we have naturally? Here you can see the, um, uh, the, 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 the water resources, the, nat the, na the natural water resources of Israel in the different basin. You can see, you can see uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, the coastal aquifer, the mountain aquifer, and the numbers represent the annual uh, replenishment, uh, uh, average annual replenishment, summarized to 1,500 million cubic meters per year or 1.5 billion cubic meters per year. However, these numbers were correct until the 1980s. Averaging these numbers of annual replenishment during the last 25 years gives much lower numbers in, in, in all the basins, summarized for uh, 1,200 million cubic meters per year or 1.2 billion cubic meters per year. That's how much we have naturally. And that means also that the climate change is already here. We get, we get less and less natural water. How much water do we need in Israel? So this is the uh, annual consumption in Israel. You see, uh, uh, we, uh, consum uh, uh, we consume uh, 1,200 million cubic meters per year for agriculture, 850 million domestic, 150 for, for industry, summarized to, uh, to 2.2 billion cubic meters per year. That's, that's the amount of water we need. So let me remind you, we have naturally, we have 1.2 billion cubic meters per year and we need 2.2. So how can you supply 2.2 billion while having naturally only 1.2? What is it? Is it a miracle? Yes, yes it, 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 it is a miracle. Okay, there are uh, two solutions for this miracle. Uh, the first, of course, is the desalination of seawater. Uh, Israel, Israel uh, during the, the last 15 years or so, Israel has constructed five huge desalination plants on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, producing a total amount of about 600 million cubic meters per year. And the other answer, is of course the recycling of our sewage. We have in Israel about 700 million uh, cubic meters per year of sewage. Out of this, about 630 is treated. So it's about 90%. Israel leads the world by far in treating its sewage, 90%. And out of this, about 580 is supplied for agricultural irrigation. 
So by these two solutions, the desalination and recycling of, of sewage, Israel closed the gap between uh, the, the amount needed for, for consumption, for supply, and the amount we have naturally. Uh, but um, in order to, uh, to use the treated sewage, one should have reservoirs. Because during the winter, when there is no uh, agricultural consumption, and still you have the sewage and the treated sewage, you have to preserve the treated sewage somewhere. That's why Israel also leads the world in reservoirs. And here comes the uh, contribution of Kekel GNF. Kekel GNF, Ker Kemet Israel, constructed 230 reservoirs over the years, supplying about 400 million cubic meters per year of, of treated uh, sewage for agricultural irrigation. Um, we also uh, deal with runoff harvesting, like here in uh, what you see in the picture, harvesting of, of runoff water during the winter. And lately, we uh, also uh, were involved in installing uh, urban biofilters, uh, re, um, uh, taking care for the urban um, drainage. And here we come to the uh, South African, JNF South Africa contributes uh, for, uh, for preserving uh, water. Here is the Chatseva Reservoir with about 1.5 million cubic meters per year, preserving runoff water for irrigation in the Arava area. So um, if you ask me what is needed, what is needed uh, um, in order to, to uh, close the gaps and even and even give uh, solutions not only to Israel, but the whole region of the Middle East. I would say we need a master plan, uh, uh, a strategic water plan that will uh, uh, consider, of course, the climate change, as I said, the demography. Israel is about to double its population within 20 years. And we must take it into consideration. Geopolitics, our relationships with our neighbors. And this plan should uh, uh, conclude, uh, include, uh, of course, desalination, uh, seawater desalination, sewage treatment and reservoirs, management and conveying, and also flood harvesting. Uh, the plan of the, of the, the, um, the Red Sea, Dead Sea uh, convent uh, plan is, is a, a strategic plan like this, and I uh, elaborate a lot about this uh, uh, um, project because, as I said, I served in the management, uh, uh, in the study management group of the, of the feasibility study. I still think that this uh, project is, um, uh, is, is a very good project for uh, um, uh, bringing solutions to both problems the falling level of the Dead Sea and supply drinking water for the Middle East as a whole, mainly for our neighbor, the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, so um, finally, I will um, say something about the, uh, J the KKL JNF Climate Crisis Center that we are establishing these days. We're, we're establishing this center that will deal with mitigation, limiting CO2 emissions and enhance CO2 sequestration, adaptation, because one has to be prepared for the future uh, climate, and also education and research. And if I have a few minutes more, I will show you now a very short video uh, that uh, presenting the climate crisis as a, as a whole and the establishment of our new KKLGNF Climate Crisis Center. Climate crisis is a scientific, 
fact. CO2 concentration increased dramatically. Temperatures are rising. In Israel, the temperatures are already two degrees more than temperatures in the 1970s. Winters are hotter. We have less rain, but when it comes, it causes floods. The summer are drier and hotter, and we have greater risk for droughts. So what can be done? The most effective tool humanity has in order to reduce atmospheric CO2 concentration is the forest and the trees. We in KKLJNF, responsible for the forest in Israel, we conserve the forest and even enhance it in order to sequestrate atmospheric carbon. Another tool is to use renewable energies instead of the fossil fuel energy. We recently established the KKLJNF Climate Crisis Center. Through R&D and pilot projects, the center will lead approaches to the reduction of fossil fuel emission, what we call mitigation, and preparation for the future climate change adaptation. So what is adaptation? We have to be prepared for the future drier and hotter climate. The forest should be adapted to survive with less water. Therefore, we should fix and improve the water balance of the forest in order to adapt it for the future drier climate. In order to improve the water balance, we should more effectively use the natural water resources and increase the production of additional water resources. We at KKL GNF decided to fight the climate crisis with all the resources we have. If we cope the water challenge and conserve the forest here in Israel and worldwide, we have a chance to hold on and even win. that I concluded my presentation thank you thank you so much uh, dr. Markle for joining us really uh, uh, such a great bird's eye view of, of the work that you do and what, what is going on in Israel uh, and and I see that you mentioned there of course what uh, KKL JNF is almost as famous for its water as its trees uh, and we still do sell trees in Israel so if you want to buy a tree for your bar mitzvah or your bat mitzvah or death or birth or or just as a Valentine's Day present, we don't really, uh, we, we're not picky. Uh, please uh, do contact our office and see what uh, tree options we have uh, for you uh, that uh, suits, your, suits your budget. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Amit Lev, uh, and he is the Trade and Investment Commissioner and the head of the economic mission at the Israeli Embassy of South Africa, which promotes trade between South Africa, Israel, and vice versa. He's had a very, very a wide-ranging career, including helping Israeli companies develop projects with the with the World Bank, uh, and as well as helping the Israeli authorities work on a variety of financial solutions. Some of which are actually now being implemented uh, on the African continent. And I think Amit has uh, some of the most fun in the sort of water ecosystem because he gets to uh, sell all the nice shiny gadgets uh, that uh, Israel has been uh, developing over all this time. Uh, and, and finding ways to integrate them into the, the South African uh, into the South African economy, and, and Amit is also going to be uh, introducing Sivanya Ari, uh, who is the CEO of Innovation Africa, and is doing uh, quite amazing work uh, here in South Africa. So, uh, Amit, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Benji. Um, you know, it's always uh, when we have a water um, roadshow with companies, uh, always aim to you know to go to Stellenbosch. Uh, it's always a good destination to uh, to have a roadshow. But you know, I came to South Africa three and a half years ago, and you know, I have like three kids here. And when my oldest, you know, he came back from school, like after four weeks, we were in South Africa. And I told him like his name is Yoab. I said, Yoab, do you want to drink some water? And he say that you can't say water. You need to say water. Um, with the South African accent. So we could talk about that, about the water. Um, and just a little bit, first of all, thank you very much for the KKLF JNF for inviting me. And 
I will give just you know a little bit brief uh, the, the, about what the Israeli government is trying to help and assist Israeli water technologies and what we did in the last few years in, in South Africa. So the Israeli trade mission is a part of the Ministry of Economy in Israel. We put um, our ministry's um, specific departments called Foreign Trade Administration. We have 45 trade missions around the world, three of them in Africa. And in the, the, the office in South Africa is in charge of the Southern region. And basically what we do is to help Israeli companies to fight partners and you know, local distributors um, to, to bring like roadshow for, for very cutting edge technologies, to bring speakers. Uh, one of the speakers that we saw in the movie, the beginning of the uh, JNF, uh, Elon Adal, we brought him to South Africa um, to speak about uh, how to use uh, water more efficiently and, and actually he's working in South Africa to help some organization to be a more uh, water uh, uh, smart operation way. And I would just want to highlight, you know, some of the, the water, um, I would say, activities and companies we did with, we have dealt in, in the last few years. And I think in water, unlike other sectors that we are dealing with, it's, it's something that, you know, let's say compared for cybersecurity, if you have a good technology in cybersecurity, good price, it's enough. You come here showing, you know, to the banks, showing to the insurance companies. And if, it's, if, it's, if it fits with all those criteria, you will sell it. Rather in, in water, it's much more complicated. You need to come with the right funding. You need to come with the right model, the, the partner's model and, and et cetera. The, you need to construct the enough, uh, I would say in, in a more appropriate way to, to, uh, to be more, um, to give more chances to your technology and company in South Africa. And, and this is why I think, you know, our assistance here, it's something that much will be much uh, 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 necessary than other sectors. And you know, one of the, the first companies that we, we dealt with here in South Africa, they do uh, uh, water leaks detections by, by imaging from satellites. They are they, uh, taking a, a, an image from a satellite and they can cover like thousands of kilometers and can give you in a very accurate matters where is your leak detections. And this is, and you talk about with Seth that this is something that is very, very crucial um, before starting you know, to desalinate the water, to filter them and et cetera. Uh, it's something that's, um, you know, you need to know how much water you lose during on the way. And they also, you know, we help them with, you know, with finding the right structure for them and the, and the right uh, uh, partner. And eventually they're working at the moment with in South Africa, doing some uh, uh, projects with the very big water authorities in South Africa, you know, detecting the, 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 uh, the leaks of the pipes in, in the country. Um, another very big uh, filtration company from Israel. Also, um, we see South Africa as a kind of the uh, springboard for the, for the rest of the continent. So you can see a lot of talent here that can take the solutions and implement it in, in other countries in the continent. And so we connected them to a very uh, big partner that took the solutions and integrated in a very big water projects in Mozambique, with millions of dollars um, to, to roll it out. Um, another company for the agricultural, of course, this is something that uh, we put a lot of efforts to, to promote because of the water scarcity uh, situation that was in South Africa. Thank God now the, the thing a little bit changed, but you need to maintain those kind of, of uh, water efficiency, especially around agricultural because of major consumption of water. And a company called Andrip, and I think that is one of their management now, but we help them also to find, like they're working with smallholder farmers to find, you know, smallholder farmers, you cannot approach one by one farmers because it will take you forever. So we help them to find those uh, cooperatives that where you can work with a lot of, of, uh, of uh, of farmers, and last but not least, we have just you know in the last few weeks um, worked with a, a company called Digitex, um, a company that's doing an amazing. I, I'm sure a lot of you read about them in the Jewish report a few weeks ago. They're doing an amazing job with uh, uh, um, using uh, algae to clear dams. They did something in the Rudapur Dam and the Satamo Dam in, in South Africa, and now at the moment of making it more commercial. And we're helping them to find more partners and, and relevant uh, um, associates that they can work with in the, in the country. So um, we, we have on top of that, the Israeli government you know, provides some funds you know, to do some uh, water uh, um, research. Uh, we have a, a, an organization it's called Innovation Authority. It's, it's equivalent to the CSIR in South Africa. And they giving, you know, also they have a specific program to do adjusting your products to Africa. So you can take, if you like have something for water that you use, you know, for very rich countries and you want to adapt it to South Africa, they will give you some funding to help you to do these adjustments. 
Um, and the last but not, and also the last thing that I want to highlight is the double is the is the all the World Bank um, and IDB and other uh, financial organizations in in the world um, that Israel in the last few years started to be a major player. Of course, we are not you know U.S. or China, but we started you know to put money in funds. We understand the value of you know of helping you know the poorest countries and to bring those technologies to be available for those countries. And Israel is playing a role there. Uh, we did some water uh, water studies. Actually, the the there was a specifically dedicated water um, um, fund that's called WRG um, 2030. Um, that's also op op operates all around the world and also in South Africa. And we had some very uh, successful collaboration with them. We did something around the water for manufacturing plants last year. And so we see also in this, in this uh, um, and we also help Israeli companies to get funds and projects through this, these organizations. Um, so if you want to get more information, you can always approach the Israeli Pen Mission, right? Israeli Pen Missions and Google um, to South Africa, and, and you can find a website and everything. So um, without further ado, I would like to present uh, uh, the next speaker, uh, Sivani Ari, who is the founder and the CEO of Innovation Africa, a nonprofit that brings Israeli solar, agricultural, and water technologies to African villages. Um, Sivan was born in Israel, raised in France, educated in the United States, with degrees in finance from Pace University and master's in international energy management and policy from Columbia University. Sivan has been working in Africa for over 20 years and over the past decade using Israeli technologies has brought clean water and light to nearly 3 million people across 10 African countries. Sivan and organization Innovation Africa have received multiple awards, including the Innovation Awards from United Nations. Sivan has been recognized as one of the most inspiring Israeli this decade by Grapevine, one of the most influential women in Israel by Forbes, one of the top 10 most influential Israelis in international business, science, and culture by No Camels, and one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life by Elgeminer. Sivan lives in Tel Aviv with her husband and three children. And in a personal note, uh, I had the privilege to join Sivan and with the embassy staff for water projects that they did in South Africa a few weeks ago. It was very inspiring, very emotional to connect a full village, a huge village to, uh, to water system thanks to Israeli technologies um, and some uh, donations from South Africa. Um, so Sivan, the floor is yours. Amit, thank you very much for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. It is truly an honor to be here uh, this evening. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to share in with you what we have done as a charity, my organization, Innovation Africa, in bringing and sharing some of the technologies that you have heard from the other uh, panelists this evening. We brought it to remote villages across Africa, and I'm pleased to say uh, for the past two years, we've been also operating in South Africa. And like Amit said, it was uh, beautiful to be there with the Israeli ambassador and uh, Bishop Lechanyane from the Zionist Christian Church a few weeks ago, connecting uh, a large village of about 10,000 people to fresh clean water for the first time. Um, it, it was a, a wonderful moment to be with you, Amit. I also want to say thank you to uh, JNF and uh, Benji, you mentioned about donating to JNF for our bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah. I'm pleased to say that tomorrow it's my daughter's bat mitzvah and she's donating all of her money and donations to Kakal and JNF. So thank you for what you do. Uh, in the name of uh, for, for improving the water resources uh, in Israel. Now, I would like to start by sharing uh, the movie, a short movie about what we do at Innovation Africa. We've been operating in Africa. I've been in Africa for 22 years, uh, literally remote villages. But for over 10 years now, I've been using, as I mentioned, mostly solar energy and solar technology to pump water. Because as many of us know, the main challenge in Africa is energy. The lack of energy means no clean water and no clean water um, keep people in poverty. So allow me to show you a short video um, about what uh, we have done so far, and then um, we will continue from there.
typhoid, diarrhea, vomiting. People use the very water. People get sick. Nabata mgonja, homa, malaria. Darkness, because we don't have light. We use kerosene. We don't deliver the services as we must. It was very difficult for us children to study at night. Kabla tu japata mradi o maji, tulko tunanga ika sa na kuajili kutafuta maji. People drink muddy water. Children uh, studying without uh, having a light. Even the mother couldn't give birth because the health center doesn't have a light at night. And for us at Innovation Africa, we want to change that. Innovation Africa was founded 10 years ago with a very simple mission to bring Israeli technologies to transform schools, medical centers, but most importantly, to pump water. When we reach to communities and you mention the word water, at that time, you see the smile on faces of these people. We identify the village that are in need of water. We build a tower and we distribute uh, the water taps all around the village. The first transformation we see ever, their skins improve. Any human being should have access to clean water. We have water under the ground. The sun is shining every day. With the knowledge and technology, we can make a change and forever. Once we do it, it completely transforms the village. I believe Innovation Africa can change Africa. didn't have any dream of getting clean water in our community in Uganda here. So we really appreciate the water, clean water. When we use this solar at night, children are able to read properly, the teachers are able to teach. We are very grateful for Innovation Africa. Are you ready? I take this opportunity to thank Innovation Africa to bring us power in our facility. You are our fathers and mothers. We are really glad to receive you. Innovation Africa has made more children to come to study because of the lights and the water. Innovation Africa kutulete mradi wa maji. Na sasa hivi maji mpaka shuleni yanafika. Natumia muda mwingi kusoma siangaiki tena kwenda kutafuta maji na maji yako karibu tunawashukuru sana Innovation Africa We are committed to bring water where there is drought, to bring light where there is darkness, to bring hope and dignity where there is despair. Thank you for listening. As you could see at the video, we've been operating in uh, many uh, countries, actually 10 African countries. And uh, I am pleased to say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in South Africa, 
we started operating uh, only two years ago, but now we are operating in three different regions. Um, so the mission is quite simple, as I mentioned, sharing Israeli technology, solar energy, mostly to bring light to schools and medical centers, but most importantly, truly, is to pump water. Here are uh, the names of the countries uh, where we operate, and we have already brought access to clean water to over 2.7 uh, million people. So the main challenge is energy. Still 600 million people in Africa are living without access to energy. And with no energy, there is no clean water. So today I'm going to uh, focus on the challenge of water that I'm seeing and I'm sure that many of you have seen across Africa. I mean, it's, it's quite common. Uh, today, there are over 400 million people that do not have access to clean water. Uh, those pictures are recent pictures. Uh, for, uh, for for the past uh, uh, few years, not even some of them are from 2020 and 2021, from Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, uh, Tanzania, uh, but also allow me to show you some from South Africa. So even in South Africa, in Limpopo, Mapumalanga, and KwaZulu Natal, uh, we see uh, the same challenge: this challenge of not having access to to clean water. And yet, the solution is quite simple, as you have seen in the movie. All we do, we are pumping water, water that exists, and a lot of it just below their feet uh, in the aquifers. All we knew need is energy to pump the water, and that's what we do. We get to large villages in South Africa and the rest of the countries, villages between four to uh, 10,000 people, and we are constructing a solar water pumping system. Very simple, very easy, and, and that's it. The first step, we drill. We drill to the aquifers, sometimes uh, 200 meters deep, but on, on average, we, we do find water at 100 uh, meter uh, deep. Uh, after the drilling, we engage the community. We are hiring at least 10 people from each village. In South Africa, we do five men and five women, and together they are helping uh, to construct uh, the tower and to help. And at the end, they get a certificate of completion and once we leave the village, we have at least 10 people that are aware about how to maintain and to operate uh, the system. So we constructed the tower, we installed solar panels on top of it, just to provide enough energy to power the pump. The pump is pumping water to a tank, and from the tank, through gravity, water flows to the taps that we're installing uh, throughout the villages. And that's it. And once we do it, as long as there is sun, there is water. We're installing between 10 to 15 taps throughout the village. And, uh, and that's it. Here are a few pictures from South Africa. Uh, we also provide taps to the schools, medical centers, and, uh, and so on. In some cases, in some villages, we're also installing an extra tank, this time for the drip irrigation that we bring from Israel. This is also an Israeli technology. And the drip irrigation allows the community to, um, to grow more food with, with less water. Um, I would like to share with you what we are seeing, the changes we are seeing in the villages once we give them access to clean water. It is true for the rest of Africa as well as in South Africa. Once we give them access to clean water, children are now able to go to school. They don't have to search for water. People are healthier. But what inspires us the most is the number of businesses that people are creating once they have access uh, to clean water. And let's watch a short video about one example. This time is in Uganda. Let's listen.
Sivan, I'm sorry, it's not playing with any audio. I don't know if you want to try and start that again. Okay, so no problem. Thank you. I have I have a solution. Sorry about that. Here we go. I know what's the challenge. Tell me if that it if it works now. Let's see. I I had been planning That's great. to grow some onions. I have here a nursery bed, a very huge one, and it has assisted me to water. We had no rain. This problem has been running for centuries. We had no water right from my childhood. No water. About four kilometers away where we could get water. But right now, I'm so happy that when Innovation Africa came, I had this plan. Onions, if you grow onions, it carries a lot of money. I said, as I will grow these onions, I will enable myself to pay for my children, to buy food, to sustain me. Even the family problems, I will be solving them with the help of this water project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And then, of course, more businesses uh, that are being created once uh, there is access to energy and water in the villages. I'm pleased to say that as of today, we have brought access to energy, water, and light to over 500 villages. Here's a quick list of uh, the villages in Uganda. The pictures that you are seeing are actually pictures from 2020. Even during the corona, we continued our operation. Thanks to our local teams, we have over 60 full-time uh, workers working across Africa. And we have provided access to clean water to 206 villages last, uh, last year. In South Africa, uh, 37 villages. Uh, during the corona time, we continued our operation. So we're also working in partnership with UNICEF. Uh, they are funding us to help uh, refugees in Cameroon, refugees that are fleeing Boko Haram from uh, Nigeria. Uh, that's uh, in Cameroon. And here a quick list of the villages we have helped in, in South Africa. So as I mentioned, in South Africa, we operate in Mapumalanga, Limpopo, and KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, this year, we are hoping to complete another 50 villages, meaning bringing access to clean water to 50 more villages in South Africa. So how we do it, we have good uh, uh, partners. I'm pleased to say that on this call, there is uh, uh, the executive board member, Stuart Stone, who is from Bayport and they have adapted a few villages helping South Africa and Zambia and also Investec, uh, Investec Bank that has adapted a few villages in South Africa and some other donors that are donating and adapting their own uh, villages. So 100% of the money go to the village. Last week, we had the pleasure of having Bishop Lechaniani and the Israeli ambassador, Lior Kenan, joining us in South Africa for the opening of uh, the taps for clean water for the first time, as we mentioned before. So how much it cost? It cost $18,000 to bring light to a school or a medical center, and it cost $50,000 to bring water to an entire village. In South Africa, it's a bit more expensive because in South Africa, we are drilling twice, two boroughs, two solar pumps, two towers, because the villages are a bit bigger than in the rest of Africa. I'm pleased to say that we have received a few awards, one of them from the United Nations, because of the technology that we are using. Uh, some of them we buy in Israel and some of them we have created, developed here in my office, in Herzliya, in Israel. And one of the technology that we have developed is the remote monitoring unit, which allowing us and the donors and the sponsors to be able to monitor the solar systems live, which means that at any moment, we can see how much water we're pumping uh, per village. So every donor has its own page. 
you can see the pictures from the before, the pictures during the construction and after, and of course, live monitoring of how much water is being pumped at any moment. Um, as I mentioned, we had a great partnership with Investec. Here's a, a short video with Steve Kosef. Steve Kosef is today the chairman of Innovation Africa, South Africa. And I'm not sure about time, but if I have the time, uh, we, we can play that video. Benji, it's about three minutes. Do we have time for it? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so let me see if it works. Working? When we see the struggle and the mothers walking for hours every single day with the hope to find water that they know will make them sick. And yet there is so much water right beneath their feet. And just by using a few solar panels, we're able to bring water to thousands of people. Innovation Africa was founded 10 years ago with a very simple mission to bring Israeli technologies to transform schools, medical centers, but most importantly, to pump water. The women in the community have to walk 5-10 kilometers to go and get dirty water and bring that water back into the village. How would you know we, people who work and live, in Johannesburg feel if we never had water. That's when we started the water project. So far we've done 10 projects in Mpumalanga to get the thing off the ground and then get other players to come in so that we could ultimately do a few hundred villages. We're delighted with the outcome. She delivered the 10 villages in half the original time using local contractors, local people to help deliver with Innovation Africa team playing the supervision role and the motivation role to actually get the job done. What we have to understand about South Africa is you've got this cross between a developed society and then you've got the underdeveloped part of our society, which in particular would be the rural areas and the townships. Most major South African corporates understand the need to play a role in helping uplift society. And we've always believed at Investec that we live in society, not off it. What I like about the way Innovation Africa work is that they get the whole village involved in the project. Innovation Africa will provide them with the technology, but it is up to the villagers to look after the tower. From the moment we identify the village to the moment we open the tap, we work together. It's a strong partnership, and that's what makes the project to be sustainable. For me, I'm a big believer in growth, and that growth can drive transformation by making a difference to communities, like we're trying to do with the water project, you're starting to uplift people. Once you uplift them from poverty, then they have hope. And when they have hope, they will start innovating. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. They can grow food. They're healthier. Children are now able to go to school because they don't have to look for water anymore. I think that all of us who live in this country want to see the country grow and develop. So we all have a responsibility, each of us in a different way, to help make a difference to our society. Certainly those of us who were fortunate enough to have prospered you know, within the country need to give back. So thank you, Benji, thank you, Amit, and all of you for listening. Um, thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Sivan, uh, for that. And I think very, very inspiring. Uh, if we look at the, the chat and the, and the comments, people are just uh, completely awe inspired by the work uh, that, uh, that you're doing. And uh, just, just to say thank you. And I also just wanted to uh, take the opportunity uh, also to say thank you to Amit. Uh, and um, I see in the comments, Mark Lovner has said that you've done amazing work in the water sector. So that's fantastic as well. Uh, and, and Sivan, just actually on behalf of the South African community, uh, I don't think people understand quite uh, how far uh, Sivan goes to, to work with our community and do stuff in our country. I can remember uh, a number of years ago uh, where, where we were in Jerusalem and we really needed Sivan to, to come to a meeting and I phoned her and she said, look, uh, I'd like to come, but, but I have to shift the meeting. I said, well, which one? She said, no, I have to move the United Nations uh, meeting out so that I can come meet with uh, you guys. Uh, and tonight she's got an even more important meeting that she's uh, had to shift out because it's her daughter's bat mitzvah to, tomorrow. So she should be uh, uh, putting up uh, uh, things in halls, I'm sure. Uh, but instead she's choosing to spend time with us. So Sivan, I really, I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for, for joining us this evening and just sharing with us uh, this amazing, uh, this amazing uh, project, which I think uh, is only, you know, you, very few people know about it so far. So it's just amazing to really be able to see it. Uh, first here in life. Thank you, Benji. I appreciate that. So uh, now we have a bit of a, an issue because we've got to go to the Q and A, and uh, questions have been uh, piling up. Uh, but you know, we, so we will do our best to get through as many uh, as possible um, to tonight. <laughs> but uh, I don't think we're going to be able to. Uh, but we will try. So I'm going to take a couple that have been in uh, that have been in. The, just being in the comment section and just ask the different people um, and, and just see what they, what they have to say. I'm going to take one from Peter Houston here, asking about the reservoirs um, in, 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 in Israel, Dr. Markle, uh, and uh, the issue of evaporation with reservoirs, which is obviously something we have a problem here with dams as well. I think, I think the question was about covering the, the reservoirs. Yes, well, covering and also, but I mean, just in general, the issue of, of how do you prevent evaporation in a reservoir? Yeah, so, so yeah, we, uh, in Israel, uh, the, the uh, reservoirs which uh, supply drinking water are already covered fully. Um, in, in the treated sewage uh, reservoirs, we still uh, don't have covers. However, there is a new there is a new thing uh, to put uh, solar panels on the on the on the uh, reservoir and prevent evaporation by that, prevent evaporation and also produce uh, renewable energy. So uh, simultaneously, uh, so uh, we do more and more uh, solar panels on the reservoirs, and that's uh, another solution for um, for covering the the reservoirs. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Appreciate uh, that answer, and I hope uh, hope that Peter uh, has a, a good answer. Uh, Seth, we had a number of questions here around uh, the impact of Israel on climate change, uh, the, the role of of the Israeli government and Kakal, which I suppose uh, Doctor Michael could also speak to. Um, what do you see? Uh, uh, what do you see as Israel's role in the issue of climate change? Where is it sitting, uh, and, and how is it working? Well, obviously, Israel is a small country, so Israel itself is not a large contributor to uh, greenhouse gas uh, production around the world. Where it, where it does make a profound difference, though, is as a, a model and as a center of innovation, uh, so that what you have is uh, one great technology after another coming out of Israel that's transformative. Um, I'm happy to share with this audience, I, I, Amit mentioned the company in passing. I'm, I'm extremely excited about one Israeli company called Endrip. And you've all heard, of course, about uh, classic uh, pressurized drip. I write about it very lovingly uh, in my book, I'll Let There Be Water. But this is a new innovation just of the last uh, two or three years. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'll, I'll, for disclosure, because I don't want to be any conflict, I'm, I'm actually an investor in the company. So I, I, but I became an investor because of the fact that I realized this is a revolutionary breakthrough technology. And what it does is it takes classic pressurized drip, which is very energy intensive, 
whether it's solar or more commonly carbon fuels uh, pushing the water through the pipes and, and purifying the water. And it has a completely different approach to drip irrigation whereby it needs no exterior energy source other than gravity, which is the ultimate renewable source. The sun may not always shine and the wind may not always blow, but gravity is always uh, in force. So, so this is a, a really a revolutionary idea. And it's just one of many that come out of Israel. And these are the types of things that are contributing to, to, um, uh, to climate change mitigation. With, by the way, and I want to add another thing. There are some people who are climate change believers. There are some people who are climate change uh, skeptics. It, it, and and whether, or not, whether or not the science is strongly points one way or another, I want to just point out that by talking about water, which is where Israel really exceeds uh, all other countries in the world in innovation, you have the opportunity to really talk about the current issue about climate change. Because you may accept it or not accept climate change. You may think it's just the natural flow of ge uh, geological time. But what we know for sure is that there is more flooding. We know for sure there is more drought. And in those realms, it is Israel's innovations that are really creating a great opportunity for others. I, if, by the way, I, 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 I'm going to have to, I, I apologize. I have to jump. This program's run a little longer than I expected. I apologize. So um, I, I don't know if there had any other questions for me, but I'm going to have to say I'm sorry. I'm goodbye. But I want to say before I leave for everybody that I am delighted if anybody would like to reach out to me, to email me at Seth, at Seth M, like Mary Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L. Dot com, or if not, uh, Benji or Bev or whatever, I'm sure I'll be glad to give you my contact information. I regard this as uh, my life's work. I love, uh, love liaising with people all over the world talking about these issues. So feel free to email me and I'll get back to you promptly. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sorry I have to jump. I apologize. Thank you, Seth. And thank you for, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, and buy Seth's book from the office. That's all I'm saying. It'll change your life. Um, I've got. To, I'm going to um, take a, a few questions in together here, uh, Sivan. Uh, the, the, we, uh, Shimron Shapiro would like to know uh, if you are, uh, if, if you have a project in Guyani, uh, 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 that that is the hometown of Julius Malema. So maybe Shimron's an EFF supporter or something like that. I'm not sure, uh, but but more generally, a lot of people are asking, who are your partners? Who do you work with? Is it supported by the government? Where are you putting these villages? Where are they going? Give, it, give us a bit of an overview of the project uh, from that perspective. Sure, thank you, Benji. So um, our model is quite simple. Uh, we have a list of villages that are in need of uh, clean water in Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, and even in South Africa. So when uh, donors are approaching us wanting to adapt a village, we give them the list of the villages that are available and as I mentioned earlier, there is a fixed cost. 100% of the money is going to the project because we're very blessed that we have a few sponsors. Again, some of them are listening tonight that are paying for our overhead. This office, by the way, is offered by Jordash. When I started working in Africa 22 years ago, I worked for Jordash company and they are uh, today still uh, supporting us. So when someone would like to adapt a village, we give them a choice of villages in need uh, with videos and pictures and so on, and they choose the village. And, uh, and then we go ahead, we do the construction, and we are welcoming the donors to come at the end to be there to install the solar panels and to open uh, the tap uh, of clean water for the first time. So this is how we've been operating. So we have families that are adapting villages for the bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, uh, some of them just for a birthday. And we do have corporations like Bayport or Investex and others corporation from South Africa and across Africa that are adapting uh, villages. So. Yeah, so it's pretty much, uh, uh, we, we get supports from, from anyone who is interested in sharing Israeli knowledge, technology, and literally changing the lives of thousands of people and immediately. Uh, fantastic, very, very interesting. Uh, Thomas just sent me a message so that I got Julius's hometown wrong. Uh, it's just, uh, so I apologize to, to, to him for that. Um, Dr. Michael, we have a question here. Uh, around uh, around water policy from uh, Adam, uh, asking if there are restrictions for household usage or personal usage in Israel of water 
or, or if Israelis pay a higher per capita cost for their water usage. If 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 the prices, can you can you can you ask again about the price about the tariff? The prices. So, so is, is is the tariff considered high in Israel compared to the rest of the world? Well, it is. Uh, um, we have we have a different uh, price tariff for drinking water and for agriculture. Uh, the drinking water, uh, by the way, is equal all over the country. It doesn't matter if you live near the desalination plant or up in Jerusalem, where it costs a lot to uh, uh, push up the water uh, uh, until the the uh, the uh, the top of the mountain, um, and it's it is about uh, um, between eight to ten uh, Israeli shekels uh, per cubic meter, uh, something like um, um, two two and a half dollars, um, and the price for agriculture is much lower, is one one point five uh, shekels per cubic meter. Uh, because the, the the water authority or or the government subsidized the the water for for farming, um, that's 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 my answer. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Rob uh, Amit saying that uh, Port Elizabeth or is it Kabecha now has approximately fourteen percent of their water left, uh, and that there are plans by the metro for desalination plants to be set up. Uh, and uh, someone I think looking for Israel to assist with this um, and look at for the Israeli tech model is is that something that the trade office uh, deals with? So at the beginning, just when I came here in 2018, we were involved with the water desalination project in Cape Town. Um, you know, referring the the tender for a few companies and helping them to find the right partners for that. Unfortunately, this project didn't happen at the end and the company did get it in South Africa, as far as I understand, got a lot of problems. So maybe it was a act of God, it they didn't get that project. Um, but yes, we always, you know, uh, are looking for opportunities and, and, and for those kind of things. And if there is a, a specific opportunity and, and, and a tender that will be uh, relevant for Israeli companies, we'll be glad to bring it to their attentions and to find who can they collaborate with here in South Africa. Right, and uh, and I, I'm assuming you can just be contacted by email um, yeah. at the at the trade office, yeah. Yeah, it's the Israeli trade mission to South Africa and Google. You will get to our website. It's the first uh, it's the first appearance in, in the page, and also we have a very active LinkedIn page where we publish and post most of the you know the business opportunities that we came across with Israeli companies. Right. Uh, okay. So there we go. That is uh, that is an an, an answer there. Uh, I hope. Um, uh, lots of people talking about the various uh, Israeli technologies already being in use: blue green water technologies, cleaning various dams, uh, and um, and and uh, a variety of, of as we said the, the irrigation and and all that sort of thing. Uh, Dr. Markle, someone has asked if you could comment on why the uh, or, or rather the progress of your Dead Sea, Red Sea project. Uh, is it coming along? Is it something that we will, will we be able to uh, snorkel down from the Dead Sea to the Red Sea at some point soon? Unfortunately, um, after, after the feasibility study ended with um, a clear recommendation for uh, implement the project in stages and, and implement the first stage, uh, I, and uh, after agreement with Jordan in 2015, um, unfortunately, uh, the project stopped and was not uh, executed uh, due to uh, disagreements, I would say, between Israel and Jordan regarding the prices and other issues. Uh, I still believe that it will be implemented. Um, and there, I think there was a question uh, uh, why should uh, the Red Sea, Dead Sea be preferred upon the Mediterranean Sea, Dead Sea project? And, and it is, it is a, a common question we've been asked. It is, it is shorter distance between the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea rather than the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. However, it is complicated, uh, not only politically, uh, it is complicated also technically, for example, you want to 
desalinate seawater, produce and convey the desalinated water for drinking, and then use the brine, the brine, which is more than 50%, in order to stabilize the Dead Sea uh, water level. So once you uh, desalinate um, the Mediterranean seawater, you have to um, convey the desalinated water if you want to, dis to, to supply the water to Jordan, to the Kingdom of Jordan, to the capital Amman in uh, elevation of 1000 meter above sea level, you have to convey it all the way through the, the, the valley, the Dead Sea Valley, which is minus 400 meters and then up to plus 1000. While if you supply it from the Red Sea, you can go all the way uh, in the eastern side of the valley without going down. That's a technical issue which prefers the Red Sea over the, the, the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so uh, I mean, that's fantastic. And uh, I think a, a webinar all by itself. So uh, thank you, Dr. Markle. Um, so we, I, I don't know if anyone really wants to answer this question or can answer this question. Obviously, there is political considerations, let's call them that, uh, in, in getting Israeli technology uh, into South Africa. Um, it has, maybe how have you been successful or or uh, are there are there good ways or best practices to making sure that uh, we can take advantage of these uh, uh, models in terms of our, our water system? I'm opening it up to any of our panelists. You can also choose not to answer yeah. it. Yeah, you know this is you know literally my work every day you know, here with me in South Africa. Look, I have to say it's 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 a complicated uh, uh, topic, of course, and but eventually you know people need to understand that. If you come with, you know, and, and, and it's a fact because there are Israeli companies that are working here in South Africa, if you come with the, with the right model and the right, you know, technology with the right price, you will do business in South Africa. Yes, this, there is, a, you know, adjustments that you will need to do, and, and we as a trade mission help the companies to get there. Um, but eventually, you know, as every country, it doesn't matter, you know, you can come from Israel or from Iran, if you have the good technologies, and you can save people money and, lie and improve their lives, they will take it. Um, they will take it because especially around water, you know, water scarcity, because they don't have the privilege to say, oh, I don't want it from Israel. It's, we're talking about you know, the, the, the essence of life. So what we have seen is that, yeah, we, you need to come with a specific uh, business mindset that, uh, um, that you, you know, for the country, um, but it's possible. And we, and we have seen some success stories in, in the, in the last few years, even with in the in the I wouldn't say you know government related like immediately, but you know in the in the in the, in the spaces of of doing business with municipalities and and, and etc. Thank you, Amit. And I'm happy to say that if you look at the the charts of Israeli and South African trade, it's actually just gone up and up over the last decade. So uh, definitely uh, doing something right there. Uh, I, th I think that will bring us to the end of our uh, presentation. I can see so many other questions, uh, people asking uh, about uh, specific technology, specific questions, uh, asking about uh, the, the work that uh, various of our panelists are doing. Uh, we have given out uh, contact details. If you have specific questions, uh, I very much suggest that you are in contact uh, and, uh, and also be feel free to be in touch with us uh, at the JNF, whether it's on trees or uh, on books, or if you want to see our local project uh, in Mamelodi and Hammersdale and Durban, uh, please uh, feel free to be in contact. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. We, we really appreciate it. I think it was fantastic. Now I'm going to hand over uh, to Michael to end us off. Great, thank you, Benji, and thank you to the panel for the most amazing uh, webinar. I think uh, such diverse, who knew water could be so exciting and so interesting and so motivating and inspiring. Um, a big thank you to, to all the panelists. Um, I'd just like to make a special thank you to Sivan. It is her daughter's, we've already mentioned her daughter's bat mitzvah tomorrow. And uh, as she said, she's donated her entire, all of her presents to, to KKL. And just really to say thank you to Sivan um, for taking the time. We presenting her with a special certificate um, on behalf of uh, KKL and, and, and JNF South Africa. Um, and um, KKL will actually be delivering the physical certificate to your house, hopefully tomorrow or the next day. 
Um, and just a big, big thank you to to all of our panelists. Um, Seth as well is a you know is a is a really renowned speaker who charges thousands of dollars for for his time, and he graciously gave it to us so that we could hear him. Obviously, Daron to have him on the panel from KKL, who's an expert in the field. And um, also a big thank you to my team for putting this together. It was uh, Bev Schneider, our national director, it was her idea. And she's worked very, very hard over the last uh, few weeks to make this happen. Um, a big thank you to, to, to Megan um, and to Kayla for, for the PR and the marketing work they did on the topic. Um, our partners at Designers Federation, Lisa here in Joburg and, and um, Chaya and Yvette in, in Cape Town have been absolutely great. It's been a national effort. Um, Durban's been involved as well, Michelle and Grant. And then, of course, to, to KKL, um, who are our sort of mother organization in Israel. They, Orna specifically is our, is our contact there. Um, the, the support we've got um, over the last uh, few months uh, has been incredible. Thank you to her and, um, and them for, for, for all they do and bring us. And we have um, some very exciting things coming up, actually. So um, if those of you on the call remember, we had a, a live tour of the south of Israel. Orna is organizing for us a, a, a tour of the north where we're gonna see um, a virtual tour of some of the, the, the sites over there. Um, hopefully in the next few months, we'll be able to launch that uh, and that will be very exciting. Um, so we'll keep you guys in touch about that. And then lastly, I just wanted to remind everybody that Monday is um, Yom Yerushalayim now our friends at the and partners at the Zionist Federation on Sunday night are having a webinar, a guided tour of Jerusalem um, for Yom Yerushalayim. So I think that's really a must. So um, those of you that haven't yet registered for the Zionist Federation and, and Mizrahi's um, tour of, um, of Jerusalem for Yom Yerushalayim, please, please do so. So a big thank you to, to everybody for tonight. And uh, we hope to see you soon with our um, Tour of the North. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to all our panelists, Sivan, um, uh, uh, Seth, and um, Doron, and Amit. We really appreciate it. We hope you all enjoyed it. I'm going to end the Facebook stream now, and then uh, I'll let you chat for a bit before I close the meeting. <laughs>